All righty. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to um, another webinar brought to you by Vegetables WA. Uh, my name's Joel Dinsdale, um, and I, along with my um, colleague Sam Grubisher, will be leading this um, this webinar today on um, fatigue management in the vegetable industry. Um, we're joined again today by Marie Gooch from Safe Farms WA. Um, and again, like I said, we're going to talk about um, uh, fatigue management and we think it's particularly relevant um, given that COVID-19 is a thing and um, and obviously we're on, on a bit of a labour shortage um, and so obviously we're trying to stretch our labour components as far as we can um, but again we have to make sure that we do it in a manner that's um, safe for all um, uh, all I suppose staff and employees business owners everybody in the game so um, Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Marie Gooch. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joel. And uh, thanks very much to Vegetables WA for taking the initiative and getting this rolling. Uh, it's a critical point that we all need to know about and manage when we're working in agriculture in Australia and all over the world for that point. Uh, I'm going to share my screen moment and just start to walk you through some PowerPoints of what we've got here. We'll be here for about an hour. Uh, just as we're going through, please, everyone, if you can see on your screen, there will be a chat on the very bottom. If you have any questions or comments, please add them into the chat and we will uh, answer those questions at the end. So this is um, because we've got quite a lot to get through. Uh, I'll be doing quite a lot of the talking and uh, Joel and potentially Sam as well adding in. However, if you have questions, please add them in the chat room and uh, stay muted and uh, save your questions to the end and then that will be managed towards the end. Thanks, I'm going to share my screen. So thanks very much uh, for joining us. And this is a joint initiative between Safe Farms WA and uh, Vegetables WA here in uh, Western Australia. And uh, as mentioned, it's going to be about fatigue management. So particularly aiming towards vegetables and the horticulture sector here in WA, we uh, have had a number of changes this year because of COVID-19 and the impact of that. And our workforce is uh, not always in uh, the supply that we might need or have had in the past. So we're going to be really needing to manage ourselves and our people going forward to be um, safe in the workplace. And this goes across all workplaces, whether you're a cafe, a news agent, or uh, a vegetable grower. This is Safe Farms, who's been around since 1994 in Western Australia and came from Farm Safe Australia. And it's a not-for-profit organisation started uh, 26 years ago. And what we aim to do is support the agriculture industry in uh, making your workplace safer, to aim to prevent accidents because many are preventable and also deaths. So sadly, uh, we have about 78 people a year who die in accidents uh, on farms. And that's 78 people who won't be spending Christmas with their family. And uh, I'm sure it happens around the world as well. Thank you. So we're here to raise awareness about work health and safety and occupational health and safety legislation, providing access to simple and effective solutions and align with quality assurance and audit programs. Uh, here in Australia, we have Fresh Care and, and many of the large uh, organisations buying the products have their own quality assurance system. So the products that we have align with those systems. So how do we manage when there is so much to do? We need to concentrate on the production, we need to also get the bills paid, we need to manage our people and safely. So it's really vital that we find ways to break it all down so that we can actually cope with all that needs to be done and then also make money and profit because that's why we're in business. Sadly, 23% of worker fatalities in Australia come from the agriculture industry. And it's only 2.3% of the workforce. So that's a pretty, it's nearly 10%. So it's quite a significant number. And um, we are very active here in Western Australia 
helping industry to implement tools uh, that are effective, simple and relatively um, quick to uptake. And we work closely with organisations like Vegetables WA who uh, are, are leading the way for their members and subscribers as well. In WA, uh, sorry, in Australia, uh, workplace injury and illness is a $60 billion industry. That is the cost to Australia. That is significant. And it can be direct and indirect. So it could be ambulance. It could be rural, rural excuse me, Royal Flying Doctor Service. It could be physio visits, occupational therapy, um, operations, repair, re repair and recuperation of people. So there's a significant uh, impact to the um, public purse, really. And also the impact of what we don't always stop and think about is the repercussions to the people who've been injured or killed and their family members and what's left. So there are three pictures of um, two guys uh, who've had serious injury. And then that is a crash test dummy underneath that quad bike. And it's just showing what um, can actually happen and is a common cause of accidents using quad bikes. So if you are using quad bikes, please everyone be very careful. I will talk about new legislation in Western Australia that's come in effective immediately 11th of October, where any new uh, quad bikes that are sold here must have operator protection devices. So it's very important that you have those in place if you're buying a new quad bike or there's a secondhand imported quad bike that's sold from that date. Going forward, uh, we've got another year here in Australia to get crush protection devices and operator protection devices on our quad bikes, and that will need to come in by uh, October next year, 2021. So Work Health and Safety Bill in Western Australia, it's been before our State Parliament and it's been being debated. Uh, on the 15th of October, it was accepted in um, uh, the State Parliament in the Upper House, and now it's going back to the Lower House. It will probably become law uh, and then it will start to become rolled out around the 15th of November. And uh, it may take some time so that early in the new year it will become legislation. However, ignorance is no excuse. This is one of 18 pieces of legislation that cross over into the farming industry. And the, the significant impact of this is that jail terms uh, are, are um, certainly an impact of if a workplace is not safe, and significant fines to both people, workers, $50,000 for a first offence for someone who's not taking, um, who's not doing this um, correctly and, and looking after themselves and others in the workplace and then um, body corporates, companies, trusts, etc. It's going to be in the millions. So get your house in order, get started and Safe Farms is here to help you. So there's different kinds of fatigue that um, we, we know about. There's transient fatigue when you just keep on keeping on, you keep going, and it's uh, when you don't have a lot of sleep. So, you know, some of us might have had children and know what it's like to be getting up in the middle of the night and having broken sleep. So when you are working significant hours, as we do in our agriculture industry, producing and providing food, Sometimes we can actually have um, extreme sleep restrictions. So that's one kind. Cumulative, so it's building up, building up, building up, building up. And we're, um, we're really pushing ourselves to uh, stay awake and continue operation as we would normally if we were not fatigued. And then there's um, circadian fatigue. So your, your circadian rhythm is how you operate. Um, it, it's when your body clock is set to do certain things at certain times. And we can try and reset our circadian rhythm via shift work and that sort of thing. However, this is kind of an inbuilt um, barometer of how we work. And this, the circadian fatigue is, you know, you normally we'll get up in the morning, it's sunlight and we'll go to sleep at night time. However, shift workers, and that does happen in the egg industry, it's when our, um, our time of work is at different times to the sun coming up and going down. So during nighttime hours, because of that flip of how we're doing things, it's going to be really important that you um, understand and manage your own fatigue. Uh, fatigue hazards are generally compounding. And uh, we all know what it's like to just not quite be on game when you're ready to go and 
able to uh, make decisions uh, as you would normally. Sometimes stress can actually impact our, uh, our equilibrium and how we're operating. It's really uh, interesting that there's been some studies done and there's empirical evidence, which means that uh, the studies completed uh, are through university research, that being fatigued can actually be a bit like being under the influence of alcohol, of intoxication or another um, kind of drug. It can lead to poor decision-making, as in we're just not on game as when we would normally be and we might be just distracted, we might drop things, we might bump into things, we might hit things if we're in a vehicle. It can compromise your memory and certainly can uh, compromise your attentiveness. So sometimes when we're tired, we just don't remember like we would normally. We don't have that quick recall like we would. We've got to actually think about things a bit. And our reaction time is lowered. Uh, and I'm sure everybody on this uh, call will understand and relate to the increased um, reaction time and, and being aware of that. So if you're in a, in a situation where there's machinery, think of a, a power takeoff shaft on the back of a tractor or if you're harvesting and there's big machines and it's all going, if you've got increased reaction time, you're not going to be able to make that decision when you absolutely need to. So it could be life and death. So fatigue management is really vital. Some of you might have seen this. This is how to identify and manage risk. So on the left hand side is a risk matrix. It's a very simple one. And a risk matrix uh, has been around since about 1951. It came in uh, as a result of um, a number of accidents in the UK and it talks to what is the likelihood of something happening and what is the actual impact if that something happens. So we could use COVID as an example. What is the likelihood that someone in their late 70s may contract COVID-19 if there are other COVID-19 um, people around with COVID-19? and their health has been compromised and they may have uh, challenges to their lungs. Well, the likelihood is probably likely to very likely. So it's putting it up in a medium high, potentially extreme area of, um, of in, uh, likelihood of it happening. What is the impact of uh, someone in that age group getting really sick? So the impact of someone who's had their lungs compromised and their health compromised, if they got COVID-19 and how would it affect their health, the impact is very high to potentially extreme. And we've seen that happen all across Australia and around the world. Using an example of uh, a worker who is uh, wearing a long shirt and the, the, um, it's not buttoned up. So it's a long shirt um, to keep the sun off and uh, they, haven't done it, but they haven't got it buttoned up and they're doing some work to work on the PTO shaft um, which is attached to the tractor because that's attached to another implement that's going to be used for either sowing or harvesting uh, of vegetables. So the impact, the likelihood of something happening to the person who's doing the work and this PTO shaft, just think about it, it's going around and around and it's going around very, very, very quickly, thinking on the back of a tractor, it's just, um, you know, very, very fast. So the likelihood of someone who's working on this, maybe an unskilled person or a young person, getting their shirt caught in uh, this PTO shaft as it's spinning around, is probably likely to very likely, and we've seen some serious historical accidents about this. So if we're going, it's likely to very likely, it's putting it up in the medium to high situation. Now the impact to the person who is, um, uh, may, may get their shirt caught. What is the impact to them, their health and their body? Well, if that shirt gets caught, they might get their arm pulled into the PTO shaft and actually macerated, so chomped up, or it might be that their shirt is torn away from them. Either way, it's going to be happening in a split second and either way, the impact is going to be major. It's not just moderate, it's major. So that risk would be high to extreme. And I would go so far as to say extreme. Now on the right hand side, we've got the hierarchy of control. And this is a way that we use to mitigate. It's, it's global, it's all across Australia. We use this to mitigate ways of managing and, and manage risk. So elimination would be, don't have the PTO shaft. 
substitution would be find something else that can do the job the same way. However, an implement attached to a PTO shaft and a tractor is a very important tool as for your vegetable operation. Now an engineering control is to actually put a cover and a guard on that PTO shaft. If you're operating machinery without a PTO guard, please go and get one. Just, just please go and get one. Now always remember anything larger than seven millimetres, and this is just a pin, so anything larger than seven millimetres is big enough to get a finger through. So why would you not have a proper PTO shaft? Then they're, they're not expensive, get them from the manufacturer. An administrative control is potentially train your people. So in Australia, it is up to the employers to provide a safe place of work. And part of that is providing education and training. Now, the other part of that is workers must also take responsibility for themselves and others and make sure that they are trained. If they're not feeling safe, they've got to ask questions. So an administrative control is to do training and provide training. When you work with a PTO shaft, you always have your clothing um, secured. You always have your hair tied back so that you are reducing the risk and the likelihood and the impact of something going wrong. Now, personal protective equipment is the last line of defence in this inverted pyramid. And in, in the case of the example of what we're using now, your PPE might be that you wear a mask, particularly if there's um, uh, grease and oil. I would err on the side of caution and never wear gloves around a PTO shaft because they're likely to be pulled off and they're also likely to be chomped up. So more so in an example of using chemicals, you would use PPE gear at any time. So in this instance, you need to be thinking about everything else before getting to that point. Moving on. Oh, something we prepared earlier. So if someone is using a power takeoff shaft, so that implement that I'm talking about attached to the, um, the tractor, and the worker's tired. So they've been working uh, seven days a week, 14 hour days, work just needs to get done. We're short of people to help, workers, family members, whoever it may be. We just haven't got enough hours in the day to get the jobs done or people to help. So a tired worker gets their shirt caught in the PTO shaft and all of a sudden it's at the, the, the arm is ripped off at the shoulder. So going back, there was a picture a couple of um, slides ago and there was a, a young man who had lost his arm in a similar situation, an accident. Now the impact and something that we don't always talk about is physical, an arm being ripped off at the shoulder. That is incredibly painful. There's multiple operations and potentially ghost pains where he no longer has an arm that is moving, but he can feel it. And many people who've lost limbs talk about um, ghost pains and where it feels like their muscles are moving, but the, the actual appendage is no longer there. The financial impact to that, the injured person may not be able to work ever again if their arm gets ripped off or they're not able to work for at least two years while everything heals. Um, there was no key man insurance for it, the cost of rehabilitation, going back to that $60 million it costs Australia every year, physio, uh, occupational therapy, medical bills, travelling to medical bills. So there's time off work and then there's the added cost, even of fuel to get to go to um, appointments. Now, the emotional impact of something like this that we don't always think about is um, post-traumatic stress. It would be an incredible shock to have some, for someone to have their arm torn off. And we know people here in Australia that this has happened to. And some have lost fingers and some have lost toes. We would probably all know someone. But the post-traumatic stress of having your arm ripped off is significant. Plus, what about all those people are picking up the pieces like the ambulance or the doctors or the family members? So there's the effect on those that we don't always think about when we just have one more go at something. So please, everyone, take that step back. Stop, think, and really consider what it is that you're putting at risk and what are the consequences. Um, you have depleted resilience. If you're straight, you've had post-traumatic stress and you've been um, impacted by losing a limb, it's, it's going to be with you forever. The effect on friends and the community to help you recuperate, but also those that are picking up the pieces, as I said. Um, the effect on the local ambulance drivers who might attend the incident. 
Now noting that often local ambulance drivers in a rural community in Australia, uh, and certainly in Western Australia, they might live 50 kilometres away from town. And if you're 50 kilometres the other side of town, that means they're 100 k's before they get to you. So there will be a time lag as well. But then it might be your friends who are picking up the pieces and you're the one that's injured. So there's a lot to think about there. This is an example of the Safe Farms uh, Risk Control and Treatment Plan. And you can see that we are going through here. We use the, the risk matrix. This one's a little bit more detailed in the bottom right hand corner. And we've also got the, um, the hierarchy of control, the upside down pyramid that I went through. So just by sharing with you how we work through this, uh, we've got an example. So if everyone's stressed and you're about to start harvest, the risk level would potentially be medium to high. So some possible treatment options are jumping to um, hierarchical control, elimination or an engineering control. Coming back to the possible treatment options, you get a less stressed person to do the task or you find ways to de-stress. So that can be nutrition, that can be sleep, that can be breathing, meditation, whatever it is that works for you. After you have identified those possible treatment options and implemented them, your risk matrix level hopefully would reduce down to around a medium. When are you going to do this? Absolutely straight away. And who's going to do it? Everybody in the business. How's it going to be monitored by everyone but checking in regularly and certainly daily during busy times? Next example is we're fatigued before harvest even starts. Now COVID-19 has impacted many people in so many different ways, so that we're, we're on edge, we're um, having to think about things that we're not always having to think about, we're working extra long hours because there aren't enough uh, people here um, to uh, do the jobs. So it's really um, important that you consider this before you start and, and even bring your team together to find ways to do this. This works the best as a communication tool amongst your team members. So if you're tired, and using me as an example, if I'm tired before harvest even starts, the risk of that, to something going wrong, potentially, you know, how, how likely is an accident to occur and how, and what's the impact of that, is actually quite high. So how would you uh, sort of try and solve that prior to harvest? Take a mini break, talk to someone, a partner, a friend, an industry colleague, someone out of the industry. Sometimes that actually helps if you can talk to someone out of the industry because they might have ideas of something that works in their industry. So the treatment strategies for those are engineering controls and potentially an administrative control as well, which is talking to someone outside of the industry. Hopefully it would bring the risk level down to medium, but I would still have as a, as a high alert if you can't get those things in place. When's it going to happen? As soon as possible. Who's going to do it? Well, everybody, because everybody's impacted and everybody's a bit tired and, and even grumpy. Um, and how are we going to monitor it? We're going to check it each time. I've got another example, which I'll go through just one of them. And then um, that, this is just an example of ways that you can help risk um, manage risk control. So let's go to point four. There's an um, absolute mountain of pre-harvest maintenance that you've got to be um, completing by the 15th of November. This is um, being recorded in late October. So we've got harvest planned for the 15th and that's actually causing a bit of um, stress to happen plus our fatigue. So we're tired, we've been working long hours and then we've got this added stress of the harvest maintenance got to get done and it, it has to get done. So there are only 24 hours in the day so what are you going to do about it? Um, and, and also repetitive work. So if you're going to do repetitive work, sometimes uh, you get so used to doing something and so used to seeing something, you miss things. Um, chemicals have been sprayed on the wrong crop. Um, you might use the wrong chemical in the machine. Uh, you might not, um, you know, you might forget to open the gate or shut the gate or that's when fingers get lost as well. So this is when accidents happen, when we're just not paying attention because we're stressed or fatigued or we're just not paying attention. So the risk matrix of that, again, would be high. So we're stressed, we're tired, it's starting to escalate. So what are the options that we've got? Um, break it down. Have a management plan. 
for your maintenance for each vehicle. So chunk it right down. Who can do what, by when, what needs to happen in every vehicle, and then start to prioritise according to the skill set of the team that you've got or their availability. Or, um, and, and by, sorry, delegate according to the skill set. Bring the team together to find out who can do what. Now, if they're new to your business, you will need to find out what they do well and what they don't do well. And then you will probably need to train them as well. If the certain skill set is not available in your team members, maybe it's time to actually call in for help from outside support. And it could be bring a mechanic in for two days and get it all done instead of stressing about it for three weeks and not getting it done. Those uh, using that upside down pyramid of the hierarchy of control, uh, the engineering and administrative controls. And this is a good communication tool to work through with your team members because they then start to understand how this works and how you want things managed in your farming business. After doing the management plan for its schedule, um, assembling the team, delegating, and then if you need to outsourcing, the risk level after that should come down to a medium possibly even a low, you find structure. As humans, we often get all um, uh, sort of worked up and um, confused and overwhelmed if things aren't in order. So this is a way to bring order into your life and also into your business. So who's gonna do it and by when? So it's gonna happen by November 1, because remember harvest is starting on the 15th. We're gonna have a check-in on the 11th and we're gonna have another check-in, I'm sorry, on the 6th, and then we're gonna have another check-in on the 11th. So we're actually breaking it down to see where are we at each week by the time we are ready for the 15th and our harvest starting. Who's going to do it? Jim. So um, Jim is uh, an in-house mechanic that works on this farming property. Sally is also one of the support team and Fred is the head workman. So Jim, Sally and Fred are there. Luigi, Luigi is still there from um, Italy. He's been here in Western Australia all year and kind of decided to stay when COVID hit. And then there's also Sean, who is an Irish backpacker. Um, he's a header, um, he's experienced with headers and uh, he's also a mechanic and he's been here since COVID as well. Oh, sorry. Um, Sally's gonna check on the PPE gear as well and get anything that we need to She's also going to check on the first aid kits and make sure that they're all up to speed and ready to go in each of the vehicles as required. How are we going to monitor this? Well, we're going to actually have a bit of a plan and we're going to have a whiteboard. So basically a whiteboard that's in the workshop, who's going to do what by when and, and have a bit of a matrix so that you can actually rub it off and cross it off and then bring up other urgent tasks or important tasks as they come along using the important, urgent and not important matrix as well. So um, if one piece of machinery is going to be needed to be used first, maybe put that one first. And if there's others that don't need to be done quite so uh, soon, put them on the back burner because you potentially can outsource to get them fixed as well. Now Sally's also going to inquire about um, the availability of a header mechanic to come out in the next two weeks and then report that back to Jim and Fred. So this is a communication tool you'll see. So who's responsible for work health and safety in the workplace? Everybody. In Australia, under occupational health and safety legislation and the new work health and safety legislation, which is coming into effect in Western Australia as well, to align with the rest of Australia, employers have specific obligations. They must provide a safe workplace. With that comes uh, education and training. And inductions are a great way to find out where uh, there's knowledge gaps. So if you do an induction, you then provide education and training, you're aligning and uh, with compliance of legislation. So you're ticking the box from a compliance perspective, but you're actually understanding how people think and act, which is vital in your farming industry and your business. Workers have a specific legal obligation to uphold, and that is the safety of themselves and everybody that they work with. Now also, something that uh, some workers may not be aware of due to age or experience in life, is always on farms watch out for children. So in Australia, often children live on farms. They are family homes as well as farms. So for any workers, 
coming to your farm, please make sure that they are absolutely well aware that children are on the farm, if applicable, and that they must always be super vigilant, can never go fast, can never rush, maybe beat the machine two times before you reverse it out, because sadly, sadly, many children are run over uh, in accidents with a vehicle running over them, and generally it's a family member who is the person who has run over the child. Uh, I'm sorry if this upsets anybody. However, it's absolutely critical that we are always watching out for children. Working alone and fatigue, um, here are some pictures of examples of different ways of working. So some of these are working alone and some of them aren't. However, uh, I think it's really important that uh, certainly if you're in Australia, you could well be working alone for many, many long hours at a time. Now, these, these pictures are examples of um, where there's teams of people working, so vital that you are looking out for yourselves and everybody else. However, often, you know, you might be on the tractor going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, or the harvester, or the forklift, uh, doing what you're doing, and, um, you know, the hours add up. By the way, if you're operating a forklift in uh, Western Australia, you need to have a licence to do that. And you also must wear the seatbelt that is supplied by all forklifts. If you don't, something happens um, and it's tipped over or, or there's an accident, um, your insurance may not cover you. So vital that you are doing all the right things and have the um, appropriate training. So there's a number of things that cause fatigue, and that is the key uh, message of this particular webinar. Um, dehydration in Australia, it's often hot, and uh, we need to make sure that we are hydrated. Please be careful because there are some medications and prescription medications where you can drink too much water and actually drown on the inside. So if that is you and you have medication and are taking medication, please make sure your employer knows what it is because there may be a, a time when you need help and they need to tell medical people about the actual medication that you're on. Um, and, and medication's medication, but you're better off as, a, as an employer, myself, and uh, having been a farmer for 25 years, you're much better off telling your employer what medication you're on um, because of that just in case it, it, uh, it becomes an emergency. Repetitive work, I talked about that and how you can just do the same old, same old, same old, same old, same old, same old. And sometimes um, it's when those same old, same olds happen that um, the accidents actually happen and people's hands get run over or their shirt gets caught or they just get distracted and um, sadly terrible accidents happen. So find ways to um, make sure you're awake and fresh. So even if it's wash your face every now and again. Inadequate sleep. I'm gonna show you something in a minute about the effect of um, fatigue on work and then also the effect of lack of sleep and how it can affect you. Uh, it's almost like having uh, alcohol in your blood system. Um, poor lighting. If you've got, uh, if you're working in an area where, um, your eyes aren't too good, um, either get some glasses or um, make sure that there's plenty of light. And you know, you can even use your phone um, as a light um, going forward. Uh, skipping meals, your nutrition is vital. It's absolutely critical that you are, um, make sure that your nutrition is um, up to speed. And as employers, while we can't necessarily look in everybody's lunch boxes or provide the food for them, and people are mature adults to be able to feed and fend for themselves, make sure that it's uh, your workers know that they must um, be having you know, a decent amount of protein, at least 100 grams of protein per um, meal per day. So I think three meals, um, that, that is about 250 to 300 grams of protein if you're going with a steak or something like that. Um, other things that can cause fatigue, too many balls in the air, we get overwhelmed, drugs and alcohol, drugs and alcohol, be very, very, very careful and even prescription drugs. So it's vital that you are free from drugs, alcohol and fatigue when you turn up to work. As a worker, it's your responsibility to be safe in the workplace and make sure that everybody else around you is not compromised 
by how you conduct yourself. Tiredness, I'll talk about that in a minute. Long hours, doing the same old, same old, like repetitive work. Early morning driving and driving at dusk as well can also affect our fatigue and we get a bit lulled into a false sense of security that, oh, we're nearly home soon. Um, sadly, in Australia, there are um, many of the accidents that happen on our country roads happen within 10 kilometres of being at home. So people are just starting to relax. So please, everyone, don't allow that to happen and don't be a statistic. This is really interesting. So um, there've been some studies done of how fatigue can affect your equilibrium and how you operate. So you can see there on, um, on the graph that after several hours of being at work, um, thinking if this is a day shift. So if it's a day shift and you get started at nine o'clock, by um, three hours in, it's probably just after breakfast, so you're gonna need food. And um, so this is where this nutrition is really vital or getting up and moving around, um, whether it's an hour into work, get up and move around and, and don't just keep doing the same old, same old, because this is where the accidents happen and, um, uh, and people are really showing signs of fatigue. And then have a look at nine hours, 10, 11 and 12 hours when you're working on a shift. There's a reason the mining industry are so um, careful about 10 and 12 hour shifts and that they build in nutrition and ways to make sure that people um, have breaks during the day or, or during their, um, their work shift. So it's really critical that we understand how our body is affected by um, being at work and then our nutrition and our fatigue levels. This is the really interesting one. So again, studies done. A good question to ask yourself and those that you work with. Did you get enough sleep last night? Are you okay? How are you traveling? Um, you know, do you need food? Some people need carbohydrates for food. So make sure, maybe have some muesli bars around, but if they need to, they just need to have a quick carb fix. So after 17 hours awake, and that's quite normal for a day for many of us, um, it's, it's like the equivalent of 0.05% um, alcohol in your blood. Your blood alcohol level is um, 0.05. 21 hours, and I'm sure we all know someone that works 21 hours quite regularly. It may be us. But that is the effect of, con of, of 21 hours. 24 to 25, um, I'm not sure if too many human bodies would be able to operate on that for too long. Um, but that's the effect of what, what your fatigue levels will be like after 24, 25 hours awake, not on the job, just awake. So it's vital that you manage your um, sleep and your fatigue. If you're not getting sleep, find a way to get some sleep. So whether it's um, uh, meditation or um, some sort of mindfulness or breathing techniques or whatever it is, if you're stressed and your mind's racing, find ways to... Um, relax. There are multiple apps around to help you do that. Most accidents are preventable. Sadly, uh, this was a very serious truck rollover and um, the impact that it causes, one, there's a, a vehicle that's been destroyed, there's produce that's been destroyed, there's impact to the business because the, the, the produce doesn't get to market. Um, and then they've got to fix the truck, let alone the stress and the impact to the driver. So often, as I said, on country roads uh, in Western Australia, many accidents happen close to home or because we're fatigued. Please, everyone, don't be a statistic. So it's really important um, that we do inductions because that way we can actually figure out how people um, think and what they're, um, what they're actually doing in the workplace. So by doing an induction and sitting down with someone for 30 to 60 minutes to find out how they're going, what are they thinking, um, you, can, you can kind of find out where they're, um, uh, the way that they approach uh, fatigue, stress, their workplace and, um, and completing work. Um, are they a risk taker? Are they super conservative and not? 
And they might have worked on a farm before, but have they worked on your farm? That's a really important question. Have they worked on your farm? Do they understand how you operate in your business? Make sure that everyone knows their roles and responsibilities. So as an employer, it's vital that everybody knows that it's their, their role and responsibility so you can get the job done. But also, they must be safe in the workplace. So that's everybody's responsibility. Um, this information is provided as guidance and actually does not replace laws and regulations. So it's really important wherever you are that you check in with the relevant laws and regulations of um, your state and territory in Australia or anywhere else. So I often hear common objections, it's going to take too long, it's going to cost too much, it won't make us any more money. What price do you put on your time? So here in uh, Western Australia, I have an assumption that I think anyone working in the ag industry should be pretty much receiving um, one way or another uh, about an accounting wage. So uh, you've done hard work, some of you may have been to university. Uh, so if you're um, operating a multi-million dollar business, your value is at around an accounting wage. So if it's going to take too long, what price do you put on your time? And then also by being in business. So it's really important that you consider that. And safety is a way to bring in efficiencies into the business. Businesses with safety systems are up to 38% more productive. A 1% increase in productivity can impact your uh, earnings before interest and tax, your operating surplus by up to 10%. So really quickly, you can get a, a pretty significant impact in your business by increasing productivity. It's gonna to cost too much. Well, thinking back to the PTO shaft and having someone with their arm ripped off or their shirt ripped off, is $100 too much to get a, a, a proper guard on the PTO shaft? It's up to you to consider. Is $25 too much to have a first aid kit in the important vehicles around the place, if not all of them? Just make sure you check the band-aids because the band-aids go off in our sun and heat. It's not going to make us any more money. Well, you might be able to negotiate a better price, but the other flip side of that is what's it going to save you? So if you reduce your variable input costs, by 1%, this is a banking rule of thumb, and it's quite common in finance. If you reduce your variable uh, input costs by 1%, it can impact your earnings before interest and tax, your operating surplus by 15%. So you can negotiate better insurance premiums and uh, particularly workers' compensation. You uh, can potentially uh, negotiate better interest rates with a bank. Um, and you will certainly be more efficient in your business. Remember those systems um, being more efficient, 38% more productive because of efficiencies and there's no lost time and there's no actual injuries. So you're not having to get over something because it hasn't actually happened because you're more efficient and safe. Those are um, the 1% increase in production of variable costs and I just spoke about those. So the vegetable industry in Australia is valued at $3.45 billion. So a 1% increase in productivity for the vegetable industry in, in Australia is just really quickly $34.5 million. So why would we not want to be part of that and have a piece of that? I'll leave you to think about that one. So we're summarising employee responsibilities um, if you're not sure about something, ask. If, um, you, you know, you need to make sure that the workplace is safe, and that's vehicles, infrastructure, buildings, fencing, whatever it is. Um, equipment and machinery. Is it good to go? Is it safe? Is it working? If it's not, then you need to speak up. It's vital that you speak up as well and say so. Um, work procedures. How do you want things done? You might have worked on a farm before, or a worker might have worked on a farm before, but have they worked on your farm? And do they know how you do things? And, and by doing inductions, you find out um, how they think. Um, what's going on in the physical environment? In Australia, it can get really hot, you know, 40, 50 degrees sometimes. It's gonna be important that you have the right personal protective equipment. 
it's well lit. There's ventilation if you're working in a packing shed or um, some sort of factory situation. If you're working outside, there's dust, heat, noise. Make sure you've got you know, um, earmuffs if it's PPE gear. And then the psychological environment. This webinar is all about fatigue. Part of that is stress and can cause fatigue and hurrying can impact or be impacted by fatigue. So slow down everyone, just stop, think, assess the risks and manage them. Always ask yourself, what are we putting at risk and what are the consequences? So um, imp uh, important uh, responsibilities are, sorry, I just need to change something on the screen. Um, if you're not getting information induction training, ask for it. You are responsible for your safety and everyone else's. However, Safe Farms can help you there. So please, if you have uh, any uh, need for help re-inductions training tools, please give us a call at um, Safe Farms WA or contact us through Vegetables WA. What we offer going forward are customised safety systems. We have a member portal and support and we're about to launch a green card for egg safety. So it will be aligned to a certificate two, certificate three, and it's a green card like an online induction for safety and um, providing training at the same time. We do webinars and workshops, and it's been an absolute privilege and pleasure to be involved with Vegetables WA today. So um, thank you very much for your uh, participation. And if there are any questions, uh, we can have a look at those and I'll maybe ask Sam or Joel if there are any questions that I can answer, please uh, let me know. Uh, thank you very much, Marie. Um, Marie, I've got a, um, a, a, a list of questions here that I'm going to work through. So um, just bear with me. Um, uh, first one is, um, uh, can there be a difference between um, agriculture accidents um, as opposed to horticulture accidents? So is there any mechanisms that we're splitting them out with currently or um, is this, yeah, can you elaborate on that a bit, please? Uh, just making sure I understand the question. The difference between horticulture and vegetables and the accidents that happen? No, no, no. Um, more, um, is there a difference between broadly agriculture accidents, so grains, um, livestock. Um, is there a split between that and horticultural um, based ones? So vegetables or? Uh, I don't or... have the statistics. They are actually really hard to come by. And we get some statistics from um, the Australian Centre for Ag Health out of Sydney University. However, it's not always uh, stipulated when there's an accident or a fatality at the medical centre. So it's really hard to trace it back. Um, many of the accidents, which are around an average of 400 per month around Australia, uh, are in the broadacre industry, pastoral, and I'll say veg hort together. Mm -hmm. So um, thinking, you know, it could be 50 a month in Western Australia, as an example, but much of it goes under the radar because at the medical centre, it's not captured. So it's really challenging to be able to give you specific um, details. Uh, often there are probably injuries that are not reported. <clears throat> Excuse me, WorkSafe, which is the regulator here in Western Australia and across Australia, um, they must have any accidents reported that is going to have a significant impact on a person, as in take them out of work for two weeks, if they lose a limb, a finger, like an appendage, a limb, a something. Um, you do that online. You don't ring a WorkSafe inspector. You actually do it online and report it. And um, it's um, interesting that, um, yeah, sorry, I've just seen the chat and got distracted. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's really hard to put a finger on and a number on who and where. Um, but a lot of the accidents just aren't reported. I heard of one on a quad bike on a farm that happened three weeks ago. 
and just not reported. And that person's lucky to be alive. Um, look, we've got another question here um, from a grower. Uh, should my business have, have a fatigue management plan? And if I don't have one, how could I implement one? Or is it safe farms? So you can um, put one together yourself. Mm -hmm. You can um, access those sorts of policies from safe farms. So we've got uh, an overarching policy that becomes yours. So your logo gets put onto it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, the key 10 things that uh, work safe, look for. I know that because I asked a former WorkSafe inspector. And so what are the 10 key things that you look for when there's an accident or a fatality? And so we put it together as um, a hard copy, but also as an electronic copy manual. We've had it by lawyers and insurers, and they've pulled it apart and we put it back together. We have, uh, we can do this for the, um, the hort and veg industry. We, we, it's, it's a generic sort of one at the moment for Broadacre. We have, um, brought in uh, transport and other service providers. Doesn't matter if you're leasing or not, we just put in all the, um, all the uh, information for you. And then that becomes yours. And then we also help you by having a support call for an hour to come in and um, help you get started as well. Noting that um, we can customise this for the vegetable industry as well. And that's, we've got great people that work for us and uh, they've got background in agriculture, so they get it and understand it. And as I said, I was farming for 25 years myself. Um, the closest I got uh, to port and veg, technically speaking, probably not, but it was potatoes. So certified seed potatoes and have grown a lot of other different kinds of industry and done some innovative um, trialling. Uh, so while it's different, we would uh, revert probably to you as experts to have a good look at it um, as well. Uh, so I've got another question here. Um, are workers covered by insurance in travel to and from work? Um, so I, I think broadly what this what this question is 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 saying is um, you know are the um, do we have a duty of care as employers um, when staff are driving home. I think, you know, if we look in sort of in Perth, um, we've got a, a number of big growers in Lancelot and I think a lot of their staff um, uh, commute from Yanchip or um, Jinjin or the likes of. Um, so there's a bit of travel there. Um, you know, are, do, does the employer have any liability or, um, you know, can you elaborate on that a bit, please? That's an insurance question. Yep. So we'd need to check with your insurer. Okay. Okay. The, the, uh, uh, the extra part of that, Joel, is that um, if you are supplying drinks after work as a bit of a cutout or wind down time, mm -hmm. I would not be doing that mm -hmm. because there is liability. I have checked that with a lawyer about it. There are some grey areas as far as are you a casual worker, are you full time, are you part time, all that sort of thing. So I would err on the side of caution and I would suggest that you speak to your insurer. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. That's great. Um, um, I'm a worker who's often tired. Um, can I lose my job if I'm too fatigued? Well, I think that's important that you have that conversation with your employer. And if you're tired before you go to work caused by external, then you need to manage that. That could be children waking mm -hmm. up, could long distances that sort of thing if you're tired because of work then you need to speak to your employer you need to be brave enough to speak up and say that i am fatigued i need to have time off and your employer has an obligation and a duty of care to allow you to have time off the recharge um another question uh how long um can a worker work and what is the minimum time off that's an industrial relations. Um, is, it, is it restricted? That's an industrial relations one. Sorry, I can't answer some of these because it's a different piece of legislation. Um, I yep. would err on the side of caution and check in with Fair Work Australia or mm -hmm. DMIRS mm -hmm. about that one. So it's a government department called DMIRS. DMIRS. It used to be called um, Fair Work and Commerce as well. Um, or there may be, if it's an employer that's asking that question, you may be getting support from an external 
industrial relations um, consultant and it's important that you ask that and have it clarified. I've got another question here. Um, what can I reasonably ask with regards to um, workers' health and fatigue, et cetera? Um, is that a question that you can answer or is that another IR-related one? Well, I, I would certainly be asking, you know, how are you going today? Are you tired? Is everything okay? How's things at home? Um, I would also be watching them carefully and that could be difficult if you've got hundreds of workers or if you've got a different transient workforce to keep tabs on. However, if it's to be, it's up to me sort of thing. So you're going to need to, to be around or have a chain of command who can help support. Joel, can you just ask me that question again? Because I want to, there's something that triggered in my mind. So the question is, what can I reasonably ask with regards to worker safety, um, health, fatigue? Um, you, know, can, can, you know, can you be probing to a point in terms of... Privacy you know, is very important and yep. you can only ask. Now, if they don't disclose, they're not providing a safe work. They're not going to be safe in the workplace. If you think something is up and not quite right, then you have a choice whether they come onto your property or not. Mm. The other thing is you are well um, within your rights to request a medical um, uh, appraisal mm -hmm. and be uh, provided to you as part of uh, any employment contract or letter of engagement. So with casual workers, it can be challenging sometimes, and this is slightly digressing, this is Marie, the employer speaking, um, and you should get um, advice on this from industrial relations or human relations um, consulting people. Um, if it's in the contract or the letter of engagement, being casual, um, you're well within your rights as an employer to ask for a medical um, assessment. And if they say no, then you probably don't want them on your property. Interesting. So, Marie, I've got another question here. Um, um, if my business has a um, farm safety system, is that something that can be reviewed by Safe Farms WA? Uh, yes, but not, not today. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm happy to have that chat later. Give me a call. Okay, okay. I will um, pass your details on to the grower who asked that question. Um, and I've got a couple more. Um, we looking at the time. We might just make it this one the lucky last one. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen when the body is over fatigued? Well, I think that's probably a rhetorical question, and everybody's different. Yeah. So we talked earlier and showed the, the research evidence of what uh, the impact can be regarding. Uh, if you don't get enough sleep and it, it's the equivalent of, you know, the body being, um, it's like you've been drinking. Yep. Um, the worst thing can happen because everybody's different is, um, could be a serious accident, could be loss of limb, depending, you know, every situation's different, every workplace is different. Um, is machinery involved? Is driving involved? So that's a pretty tricky one to answer and um, how long's a piece of string? So, sorry. Sure. But I just, um, I'm not quite sure what that one means. Well, look, um, I think time is quickly getting away from... Can I just in for a second? Because there was another question about um, the quad bike protection and having it installed. Oh, and it just triggered something from a conversation we had earlier um, saying um, as of next year, all quad, do all quad bikes need the protection installed? Or is it just the new quad bikes and that was something we were talking about and I thought, oh, that's a good one. So you could answer that. <laughs> Sorry, Joel. Uh, uh, 11th of October this year, any new quad bike sold or imported secondhand quad bike sold must have an operator protection device. So think of those, um, they were called crush protection devices, but the new name from um, the ACCC. And this legislation has come in uh, nationally from the ACCC and it's effective immediately. So it must have an operator protection device. Now, so any you, new one on farm, it's got to be protection. If any new one that was bought after the 11th of October must have one. If your uh, machinery supplier has not uh, supplied it, take it back. Okay. Just, that's it. Take it back. If you after the 11th because it came in and, and everybody's been told about it. 
So that is because 14 people were killed this year between January and the first week in July around Australia. And people keep getting killed. What happens is they end up underneath the quad bike and asphyxiation is the leading cause of death. Often it's children. Often it's men over 60 who are using them as mobility devices. The accident I heard about, which happened a couple of weeks ago, was an older gentleman and he turned it over and uh, ended up getting his leg crushed. He was probably doing three to five kilometres an hour on fairly flat terrain. So it happens. Uh, as of 11 October next year, uh, any quad bike sole must have one. So like, you know, we talked about um, the, uh, the switch that came in for cars, um, immobilizers. Immobilizers, yep. But just like immobilizers, you've got 12 months to get your hack together and, um, you know, use one. If you are using a quad bike in your business, ask yourself, is this the safest vehicle for the job? That's, the, that's what WorkSafe asks for. Is this the safest vehicle for the job? Could we use a more safe vehicle? I understand why people use quad bikes because often it's boggy or, you know, um, it's, it's just to go over there. However, be aware that people are killed using quad bikes very regularly. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, um, and in the uh, Vegetables WA uh, summer edition of your magazine, uh, we're putting in uh, a piece all about the quad bikes. So um, we'll be sharing things on social media. So if anyone wants to jump onto Instagram or Facebook and we're sharing things like this and we'll be sharing more and more things going forward as well. And you know, please like it and share it amongst your, um, your friends and team members. Well, that's great. Well, look, I think we've just ticked over past um, midday now. So um, I'd like to say... A big thank you to Marie um, for um, giving us such a great presentation. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, and like I said, if you've got any questions, contact Safe Farms or Vegetables WA. But thank you very much, guys. Have a great day.